Uh, my name is Martin Van Crenendonk. I'm a professor at the University of New South Wales and the director of the Australian Centre for Astrobiology. Are we alone? Uh, no, it's just you and I here, so <laughs> don't be afraid. <laughs> Are we the life forms of Earth alone in the universe? Yeah, that's uh, a big question and uh, of course nobody knows until we have positive contact, but um, it's a numbers game, isn't it? Life is about complexity and it's about numbers of combinations to make complexity and uh, the universe is a very big place and so if you play the numbers game of you know planets around stars and you just end up with billions and billions and billions of possibilities and uh, you know people have said that to make life to make the complexity of life maybe you need a trillion reactions to get to the complexity of something like DNA that self-replicates it sounds wow it sounds like a lot but a trillion in the scope of the universe is you know infinitely small almost so uh, it's a numbers game. If it happened here once on Earth, there, we know already that there are many conditions in the not too distant surrounds where there are suns about the same size as our sun. There are planetary systems around them, some of which have planets that are about the same size as Earth or a super Earth, many that are in or just near the habitable zone. So, you know, if the conditions are right, yeah, maybe we're not the only one of that experiment. Well, just as a counterexample, Martin Van Kronendonk speaking English, uh, that happened on Earth. Yep. And I would not guess that that is happening anywhere else or has happened anywhere else, in, even in an infinite universe. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and the reality is we don't know. It. it is such a complex set of reactions to make something that they self-replicate and then evolve over four billion years from simple microbial life to more complex life in animals and then... Uh, you and me sitting in this room, it is uh, one of those things you think is infinitely unlikely, and yet it has happened. And if it's happened once, with the number of examples that we know are out there in the universe, is that likely to be the only case? I don't know. I've sort of swung probably more towards accepting the possibility that there is life elsewhere. And I know from examples on you know, what we're looking at in our, our nearest neighbor in Mars, that it has geologically the right conditions. We can see there was liquid water. We know it has volcanoes in terms of heat. It had hot springs. It had many of the elements that we know on Earth were important for making life. It had carbon, it had water, all those things. So, maybe. And what, you said you used the word life. What is that? Well, that's, of course, uh, a, a, a difficult challenge. There's no widely accepted um, definition of life. But um, most would say that it has to have the ability to self-replicate and evolve through time. Uh, it's a chemical system, uh, and on Earth that's using carbon as a, as a basis. Um, but if I put you in a spaceship, you couldn't self-replicate, so you're not alive. No, but, you know... How about you and your wife? Well, me and my wife you, probably you, could. No, yeah, you couldn't so. because you'd need oxygen. <laughs> well, you we need, need oxygen. oxygen. That, therefore, you can't self replicate I don't understand this whole, you use the word self-replicate. It's a word that I have never understood. Can, can you explain that? Well, I mean, not for, so animal life evolved and, and developed uh, reproduction through sex. But microbial life, a much more fundamental component, they self-replicate by just splitting their DNA and, and making copies of themselves, basically. So they so, don't depend on any other life forms? No, they don't necessarily depend on other life forms. So it's an internal so you, process. You in killed way. all the other life on Earth except for what is it? Well, uh, a microbes, an archaea. A or, microbes. Yep. So. so you don't think that microbes are as dependent on other microbes as we know we are? Uh, I mean, microbes are known as uh, living in communities because they cycle different elements. So they do depend on each other. Uh, in many cases, so they cases, don't self reproduce. They do. No, they do self-reproduce, but it's in terms of food and energy, they often live in communities. Because they can't they reproduce can, without. They can't self-reproduce without energy from the community. No, but they can get energy from rocks and yeah. from chemistry. So they don't necessarily need other microbes, and we know that from the lab. We can have com populations of a single uh, microorganism, and it will replicate and reproduce and stuff like that. So we know that that can happen. And you just shine light on it. Uh, well, that's photosynthetic bacteria, but they can use chemical energy from the earth. They can use, you know, the, an electron from glass. They can use it from, you know, the oxidation reaction. Like an electron is all many microbes need to, to procreate and to live and to metabolize. And so that is the most fundamental type of life. By, are, li by electron, you mean redox reaction? Well, generally by a redox reaction, or most commonly by a redox what reaction. What else would it be besides a redox reaction? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the most. I, I don't actually know.
<laughs> electron's got to fall, right? It's yeah. Like, so, well, if it doesn't I mean, you fall, electron, then you can't get energy out right, of it. Right, but you get an electron from sunlight, so obviously with uh, photosynthesis, that's okay. using sun's energy as well. Okay. But that's not the only metabolism. And so it's not the, the energy of the meta metabolic state and the reproduction is not dependent on communities. That can happen individually within organisms, microorganisms. But animals then develop sex, and that's a whole different way to reproduce, and then right. you need two components of stuff. So. Now, let's say I took a single, I don't know, E. coli or something, you know, some single cell. Bacteria, yeah. And you think that can self-reproduce? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and that's, so bacteria yeah, that's are alive. that's been observed and tested, and we know that's, that's right. what Right, but yeah. you and I can't do that. And no. So we're less alive than a bacteria. No, we live in a different way. We're, we're one of the, we're, we're on more the third on branch. We're dependent on on the third branch. And, of course, we're a community of microbes. I don't know what the proportion is, but it's a very... Significant proportion we've got a microbial community in our body, but uh, but animals invented a different way of reproducing, which mm -hmm. was by combined sex, and that allowed for greater diversity and evolution. So that's one step along the way to complexity, which is extremely important. And one of the challenges in, in understanding the tree of life is knowing when that divergence happened, and what the uh, driving forces in the planet or in the you know ecosystem uh, were around to make that that evolutionary step. So let me ask you again: Are we alone? Uh, I don't know. It's a probability thing. Uh, okay. And at this point, it's a belief because we've only gotten an example of one. So you can't, as a scientist, you can't give a definite answer until we find evidence for it. Is this an important question? I think, I think it's, uh, it's one of those fundamental questions. And, um, you know, that the process of how life originated has been talked about in lots of different ways. There's the Darwinian evolutionary model, there's the God model, and I think if we find another example, it has profound implications for understanding how we belong within the universe, and, and maybe, you know, it's not so unique, and if it's not unique, then you know that it can happen elsewhere, and we're just one example of something. So it's a, it's a ph philosophical um, exercise to understand if there's life elsewhere than... On but you're Earth. interested in this question? Absolutely I'm interested. I think Are the origin of life, like if we can understand better about the origin of life, we understand better how our species arose, you know, what were the series of events that led to that, uh, and can we see that in another place, and does it look the same? Uh, yeah, I think it's a fascinating question. To better understand ourselves. Yeah, yeah, essentially. I think a lot of scientific research and endeavor is, is to better understand ourselves and our place in this universe. Sounds a little narcissistic. Well, I... Say that's possibly true, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's all those it's those questions that we uh, all face when we're about ten years old and go camping out under the stars, right? Well, Where do reason, I come from? They're like, the, how did I get it? What are these stars all about and stuff? So. Well, the reason I'm asking this is because some people care about this question. I care about it. You care about it. But a lot of people say, "Oh, that's just big pictures. If I don't care, I care about you know getting a, something a beer and watching a good show." Sure. And so. Is there a way that we who are interested in this question can inspire others to get involved in it or to, to wonder about the same thing or so we don't care about other people who don't, aren't curious about it? Well, it's funny because like we get involved with the general public in many different um, avenues and ways and I think everybody has that natural curiosity but of course we're not able, all of us, able to pursue those questions. Like I, I'm interested in lots of things like how does a, a batter hit a a baseball pitched at, you know, I don't know how fast, 120 miles per hour. Like physically, it's supposed to be not possible, and yet it happens. And I'm really curious to find out how that is, because then you'd make a better batter and all the rest of it. But I don't have time to do it. But many people are naturally very interested in, like, those whole questions. But they don't have the time. They've got jobs. They've got wife, family, kids, and all the rest of it. So I see our position as really an incredible opportunity for the community to be able to pursue these questions. And, you know, you can see that in the success of science documentaries about, you know, the origins of life. I think that's, I think that's a very profound question that many people share. Well, what do we know about the earliest evolution of life, about the emergence of life and the evolution of life on this planet? Well, we now know a lot about the evolution because we've studied the geological record. We can see the steps through time. We know um, from studies of DNA, which are the most primitive microbes, and how they changed. Not so much yet when exactly a lot of those steps happen, but um, that's part of what the community is doing now, is tying it back into the geological record as much as we can. So I know a lot about the evolution. The origins of life is still a major challenge for science. It's again one of those systems that's so complex, 
that there are many, many steps involved. And it's not necessarily even just a linear progression from amino acids to DNA. There may be all kinds of ways in between. And so that's something but there are lots of labs now working on that too, and we're starting to understand some of those steps. And um, it's a process. And well, as what do we, we get know, better technology? What do we know about life on Earth, let's say, m more than three billion years ago? Yeah, so I study early Earth, and many other people do. And uh, for a very long time, the oldest life on Earth was known to be in rocks that are about three and a half billion years old in the form of stromatolites. The oldest are, macroscopic fossils. Right? Yeah, the oldest microscopic, um, macroscopic Mac fossils, um, supported in some cases by microscopic fossils preserved in, um, in some of these ancient rocks. And uh, we know that they were made by communities of living organisms in shallow water, you know, accessible to sunlight, but maybe only using the chemical energy from the environment and from the rocks. Um, that's well dated, we know the age very well, and there's just been a recent discovery of, of stromatolites, these microbial community structures in rocks at 3.7 billion years from Greenland. So that's now the real new benchmark for the oldest life on Earth. And again, in shallow water, in a marine environment in that case, in 3.5, possibly on a, a terrestrial environment. Um, and one of the exciting things about the, the rocks at 3.5 is that there's a whole diversity of life already in like the what's almost the oldest evidence for life we get an incredibly complex array of different biosignatures these microscopic fossils they're not all just cone shapes or domes but we get these beautiful branching candelabras we get you know smooth mats we get big coniform structures we get a whole variety of shapes already that suggest that the the community was already quite complex by 3.5 it's amazing and this find, in, this find in Greenland is also interesting because it just narrows the window to sort of a habitable, habitable conditions on Earth, which may have only started at about 3.9, bless you, yeah. at, the, <laughs> at the end of the late heavy meteorite bombardment, and then life already at 3.7. So that, you know, developing that complexity in a habitable world, it turns out that that time span is narrowing significantly. Right? We used to think that it would take us. Life is so complex. It would have taken a billion years or half a billion years to get all the combinations right and everything. And if we think about a uniform ocean, you need to have the chemistry gradients and you know package all these things up in a certain way. But now we're starting to think that, hey, maybe life arose really quickly. And if it can do that on Earth, then there are lots of other planets where that window of habitability, like liquid water, may have been much more narrow. But now it may seem that it's possible to develop like quick life more quickly, I think our, our, the understanding of possibility of life, for me, has actually expanded tremendously by that. Now, you, with your hands, you had constraints from two sides. Yeah. My understanding is that the earliest life is getting older and older, but the constraints on the other side, the late heavy bombardment, are kind of wishy-washy. They're not as firm as they used to be, and it may even go away. So I, we don't have that, you know, so one hand shouldn't be there. <laughs> well, that's, that's only partly true. I mean, that they are, are finding out that, that that story about the late heavy meteor bombardment is possibly much more complex and maybe spread out um, over a longer time period rather than just a spike at 3.9. But what is well constrained is that there are still very large bolides impacting the moon at 3.9. And if we do the transfer of energy, you know, from small moon, which is about the size of Australia, to large Earth, the bolides would have been bigger and they'd be big enough to vaporize the oceans. And that's really, you know, this idea of a sterilization effect from the energy and heat imparted by these late impacts that would be enough to really set it back to T0. And now you, so, now you, you said that the, this life form, these stromatolites were in shallow marine environments and yet not necessarily photosynthetic. Yeah. Uh, but how about life underneath? Why would it be in shallow marine? If, I, if you're a life form, why, if you're re using a redox gradient, you could get that from a hydrothermal vent or some other shallow hydrothermal vent, but you wouldn't yeah. be constrained to shallow marine. No, absolutely. So we talked about macroscopic fossils, and um, those are the structures that were found already 30 years ago and have been well known. But as we study those systems more, and in fact this 3.5 area in the Pilbara is, is the best example of it, they are associated with a shallow hydrothermal system. And the veins that penetrate down into the footwall are full of organic matter. 
and that organic matter has highly fractured carbon isotopic values down to minus 32 per mil, and they're variable, and people have now done enough studies on the composition of that organic matter to know that it's not just an abiological carbon formation by breakdown of carbonate or something. It really looks like it's of a biological origin. So when do you think life got started on Earth? Well, I would say it probably got started very soon after 3.9 billion years. And you're saying after 3.9 because of the, your understanding of the late heavy bombardment? Yeah, that's my understanding. And if yeah. that went away, what would you say? It could have formed much earlier. How early? Uh, well, there's, uh, there are lots of ideas about, there are publications about a cool early Earth back to 4.2 billion years old. We know that the, the hydrosphere had formed very early from all kinds of modeling studies and from the composition of very ancient zircons that we have on Earth, there's indications that they derive from melts that had activity of water. And so there was water available. And, and if you look at composition of zircons in the very, very ancient Earth record, there seems to be a shift at about 4.2 where water started to get involved in the generation of magmas. And so this has given rise to this cool early Earth. So if the meteorite impacts were either wide enough apart or not as big as we thought they are, it looks like, yeah, you might say that life formed at 4.2. Now we're interested in life elsewhere, not necessarily on Earth, but we're trying to use Earth as a model that could help us inform inform us on what could happen elsewhere. Yeah. So what do you think is the most, of all the research that you do, what is the most relevant for making guesses, constraining, trying to understand life on other planets? Yeah, so, and, and that's actually changed a lot just in the last year because of some of the finds we've made back up in the Pilbara. So this area is, like I said, that the macroscopic fossils have been known about for a long time, and I, I brought an example along here. So. This, was, um, this is a beautiful example of, of stromatolites, which have very irregular, wrinkly surfaces, uh, little protruding bumps and, uh, and hollows here. This is typical of the complexity of biology. So that was a bacterial mat? Yep, a microbial mat. How long mat. ago? Yep. This is 3.48 billion years 3. ago. 3.48, so about 3.5 yep. billion, 3. 5 billion 5 years ago. 3.5 billion years ago. And, and un like I said, until August, this was the oldest evidence of life on Earth. And was that doing photosynthesis? Well, it was in very shallow conditions, so it may have been undergoing photosynthesis, but the problem has been that the Archean, um, the Australian outback where this is found has been under really extreme weathering conditions. And so these surface samples that we have, we can't get any information about the microbial community that made them. So we'd only be guessing to say that if it used photosynthesis or didn't. Well, what else could it use? Well, it could use, like I said, just the chemical energy from this hydrothermal system, which we know is there. It's pumping through hot water. There's methane there. There's sulfur. So it's like, a, like Yellowstone there's, or something? Or yeah, like, very similar to Yellowstone. Or Rotorua. Uh, well, they're, they're both similar. They're terrestrial hot spring environments. And that's actually been the exciting find is we thought that these ancient fossils had been in a shallow marine environment, but recent discoveries by one of my PhD students found deposits of a Rotorua or a Yellowstone hot springs on an exposed land surface. And they're intimately related with these stromatolites. And so it looks like they could have been using the chemical energy from these hydrothermal systems as their met metabolic source. Fresh water, salt water? Fresh water. That's the beautiful thing. And then- Why is that beautiful? Well, because there are a number of things. One of the, there have been many problems with the currently favored model on the origin of life in deep oceans at hydrothermal vents, like these black smokers in the deep oceans. That has been modified a little bit to talk about white smokers, slightly cooler, but still in deep ocean conditions. But there's a significant problem that a number of groups have recognized that before you get to anything as complex as RNA or even DNA, to bind amino acid molecules together to start making things like sugars, like ribose and stuff, you need the energy of wetting drying cycles to kick out a water molecule that binds those early, quite primitive and very common organic molecules together. So like the deep oceans are out, it's just, forget it, you can't do it. Because all those early organic molecules are hydrophilic. They, 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 you know, they just don't work in water. So are hydrophobic. They don't work in water and stuff. So you need wetting drying cycles. And then if you think of terrestrial hot springs, you know, a, a geyser fountaining up the edge of the pool, it expands and contracts. And so you get wetting drying cycles. And there's a group from Santa Cruz that we're working now in, in California that's been doing experiments and shows that if you put in sort of an organic soup 
and you do the wetting drawing thing, you form lipid membranes that look just like cells and have the same composition as cells. And the cool thing that happens is that when they get dried out, those bubbles open up. And as organic molecules get more complex on the side, then you rehydrate them, they close up again. So you can compartmentalize progressively more complex organic molecules within these lipid... Oh, it's just, it's so exciting. And the other thing we found from the old rocks is um, we found these little layers here in one horizon that's only about a centimeter thick. And we thought that all oh, these look like uh, stromatolites, but they're actually just crusts, laminated crusts. But um, when we took a thin section, so just a very thin sliver of the rock, we found that those laminated units were rich in a mineral called tourmaline. And tourmaline's rich in boron. And it turns out that there's a group that's done quite a lot of studies about, so not only do you need to sort of expel water, but you need some larger ion um, elements to act as a catalyst for bringing these things together. And it turns out that boron is one of the most useful uh, catalysts in this what's called polymerization, making more complex molecules. And so we found a way of concentrating boron in a terrestrial hot spring, which you can't do in the oceans. Again, right? And same for zinc, same for hydrogen. So all of a sudden, terrestrial hot springs are just so exciting. And they give you orders of magnitude more complexity because one geothermal spring field could have a hundred different pools of range from pH 2 to pH 11. They mix and match components. They wet dry 24 times a day because geysers go off once an hour. And so you just, so if you do a back of the envelope calculation, 365 days a year, a hundred hot springs, wait, 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 24 wait, wait, hours wait, wait, a day, wetting wait, drying wait, wait, cycles. You're going four billion years. First, the rotation was faster, and you didn't have 365 days. Oh, before. well, that doesn't matter. 360, 360. <laughs> no, 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 no many shorter, shorter, maybe but, 200. I guess. But that doesn't change time overall, right? No, I no, mean, no, that's no, just yeah, a relativistic right. thing. So, But the actual amount. So you can actually make like a trillion combinations in 10 million years. And so maybe life in terrestrial hot springs could develop really quickly, geologically well, really quickly. Well, everything you just said... There's nothing special about the Earth. Everything you've just described, no. I could easily imagine, would be on an Earth-like planet elsewhere around other stars. Absolutely. Yeah. If that's the case, then life would be around a lot of stars. And many people think that once you have life, you get intelligent life that make rocket ships. But we haven't seen any rocket ships, and this is known as the Fermi Paradox. If life is so common as you seem to suggest, then where are they? Well, so... Life may have formed quickly and made a microbe, a single cell. And then it took four billion years to get to, you know, a community that's evolved enough and, and sophisticated enough to be able to build rocket ships. And any population has a very finite lifetime, so, you know, one blip in time to develop that kind of sophisticated technology, yeah, who knows if it ever got somewhere else. One thing that is unique about Earth is its mode of operation, which is plate tectonics. And plate tectonics is important because it cycles water through back when, when down. When you say unique, I think you mean unique in the solar system, but you certainly don't mean unique in the galaxy. Well, the reality is we don't know. It's, it's, it's probably a common mode of tectonics, but it yes. only works on a water-rich planet. Oh, and water is everywhere. Uh, water is everywhere, and we know some examples like Ganymede and uh, Callisto that have water ice crusts and probably oceans. Oh, I, I mean oceans. everywhere in the universe. Everywhere in the universe, yeah. H2O, yeah, so H and O, very H common. H and O, yeah, yeah about <laughs> as common as you get. Yeah. <laughs> so it's quite possible that there are plate tectonics developed elsewhere, but I think plate tectonics is, uh, is important in allowing the longevity of habitability in a planetary system. So, so can you give us an example of how plate, uh, the lack of plate tectonics would shut down life? Well, so if you just have a, a hydrosphere, and you have really, um, and you don't have plate tectonics, you just have a rigid lid, right? So incoming sunlight energy uh, disassociates water and the hydrogen escapes. The, the, the hydrosphere would eventually just escape the space. And that's what happened on Mars. We have good evidence that Mars has had a much shorter geological history because it's a much smaller planet. Wait, wait, so so you're telling faster. me that plate tectonics is a way for a planet to maintain its water? Yeah, because it puts it back into the mantle, mm -hmm. and it stores it there for a while, and then it comes back up in new gases, you know, volcanic magmas and gases and stuff, but it recycles. But doesn't a, a solid lid keep water down as well? 
uh, it prevents the movement back and forth, but if it's already down, then it protects it there. No, it, well, there are two problems because uh, so planetary bodies degas as they cool, so all the vapors, all the light elements, the wa including water, escape from that system very early into the outer parts of the, the planetary system, into the atmosphere. And then it rains down onto the surface if the pressure conditions and the heat conditions are right. Yeah. So, but so then it's hard, it's almost impossible, if you don't have plate tectonics, it's impossible to get that water back down into the mantle if you don't have plate tectonics. So you think the early Earth, let's say, before there were plate tectonics, did not have water at the same depth as we have it now? I'd, uh, it seems like that was probably the case. Yeah, we don't get such typical hallmarks. So water and magma interact and they um, develop unique compositions like andesites, which is the, the composition of rock that you find in volcanic arcs around the world. The Ring of Fire in New Zealand, you know, Japan, all those volcanoes, they're largely andesitic, which is a bit of mantle magma and water melts to make an andesite. And so that's a hallmark of plate tectonics, but it's also a unique composition and you don't see those compositions on Mars. You don't see those compositions on Venus because they don't have plate tectonics. Right, but but I th is it pyroxene or olivine that holds water better? Do you uh, know that? Olivine holds water well, okay. a little bit better. Okay, I think. it holds yeah. water. Let's suppose yeah. olivine holds water a little bit better. I don't need plate tectonics to hold on to water. The olive if I'm olivine, I'm holding on to it. I don't need plate, plate tectonics to tell me to hold right. on to it. But that's in a relatively cool mantle like we have now on Earth. And that's, again, four and a half billion years after the planet cooled significantly. So in its early, very hot period, the mantle can't hold that water. It just gets degassed and stuff. So that early phase, and then it cools and it recondensates on the surface. And if you don't have plate tectonics, you don't get the water back down into the mantle. So the stuff. early so Earth got rid of lots and early. lots of water, and then sure. plate tectonics is a method for a planet to hold onto its water. Yeah. Yeah. And when do you think plate tectonics started on Earth? Well, so there's... There's very solid evidence now from a variety of different studies around the world that we have evidence for plate tectonics at 3.2 billion years. And there's some pieces of evidence that show plate tectonics earlier than that, but it's not the style that we know of today. So in, in the modern day, plate tectonics, when one plate comes towards another, the oceanic lithosphere is so big that it gets heavy after it's been away from, and it starts to sink. So you get these subduction zones that are quite steep but on an early, more vigorous Earth, you can get subduction, but it's very shallow. It just sort of, you know, combines and, and merges and overthickens each other. But it doesn't go in that steep manner, and that may sound pedantic, but that steep manner actually causes that water to melt and release back into the mantle wedge and make these andesites. But in shallow subduction, you don't get that. And so in the rocks older than 3.2, we get hints of subduction, but without that really steep thing. And no that andesites. Means no andesites. And so that means that you get... You, you don't have evidence for very large plates, and to get large plates, you have to have cool conditions. Because when you have a hot planet, it's very vigorous, and you get mid-ocean ridge spreading everywhere, so you only get very small plates. And it's only when the planet cools, and the, 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 the other thing that supports the start of plate tectonics at about 3.2 billion years is from uh, thermal modeling of the Earth. So they know the power that's being... Uh, exuded by the planet, just heat lost to space because of breakdown mostly of radioactive minerals. It's a, it's a power law decrease curve, and there's an amount of heat that you can lose just by conduction through the crust, through the lid. And those two curves cross over, and when they cross over, it's right at three billion years. And so that, that, and that crossover point is important because when you can lose more heat by conduction, than there is available in the output of the planet, it allows the plates to grow. Do you mean and conduction or convection? Conduction. Conduction. So if you have a if you have a basaltic crust like a lid on the Earth, mm -hmm. it loses heat by mm -hmm. conduction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the the mantle is convecting underneath it, but that's not losing heat. That's just moving it around. It actually conducts through the crust, and so that can only lose so much heat. Mm -hmm. And if there's more heat than that on the planet, it's always going to make new crust, right? So you're always making new crust. And you'll never get old, cold crust that can then sink between each other and start plate tectonics. So this whole thing happening at 3.2 is really exciting and looks like a, a really critical onset of our modern sort of plate tectonic style. Um.
do you think the number of plates has increased with time then? We have, I don't know, maybe 12 now. There used to be now. 15, used to be 20, used to be 25, used yeah. to be 50, used yeah, to be Yeah, it looks like it was probably quite a few more plates going back through time, and we're heading toward a, a two-plate planet as it cools. And this, this thing here you pulled up, this stromatolites, that was yeah. 3.5 billion years yeah, ago. How many plates were on the Earth when those things well, were alive? we don't know. But Take a the guess. the possibility is that there was something like 36. 36, okay. Yeah. And the reason cool. I say that is because there's a very well-known discipline from mathematics called tessellation, which if you have a sphere, you can only cover it in a very limited number of ways by plates, right? So a soccer ball is a classic example where you've got hexagons and pentagons of roughly equal size to cover a surface area. And it has to have that complexity to cover it in a relatively equal way. And so then you go from a truncated dodecahedron to these different geometries to these 12 plate configuration now is a dodecahedral one. But then the next stable configuration is only with two plates. And so we're moving towards that. And once you get two plates, everything starts locking up and the whole planet will change again. But that's well then into the into How the many future. billion? 10 billion years? No, I'm not No, sure. not 10 billion Maybe. years. We'll probably be swallowed up by the sun before then. Yeah. Um, now, you've told us a lot about water and geology and the early Earth, and these are things that you can expect to find elsewhere. Yeah. Chemistry, for example. We think the same chemical elements are everywhere. Sure. Um, but a lot of astrobiologists are trying to play the following game. They're saying, if we can look at the biology of Earth and find several things that have evolved independently on Earth, then these things become candidates for what we should expect elsewhere, for mm -hmm. what we should expect life to evolve into elsewhere. So sometimes uh, it, we talk about, I don't know, eyeballs. And uh, most biologists, I don't agree with them, but most biologists say that eyes have, in, have evolved independently multiple times. A number of times, yeah. yeah. And they'll say the same thing about saber teeth, and they'll say the same thing about flight, and they'll say the same thing about... So the question is, do you buy into that argument? And if you do, can you give us some examples? Uh, it's a bit hard. I mean, that's really the realm of an evolutionary biologist. And I think those examples are well documented. So the, the thiols seen in Australia, you know, the Tasmanian tiger and stuff like that, it's a marsupial. It's not a mammal, but they evolve into very similar geometries because they have similar requirements. And, and evolution is adaptable in that way. It absolutely happens. And you know, it comes to the larger question that we discussed at lunch is, is man an ultimate product of evolution? And that's a very anthropogenic or anthropomorphic um, kind of way of thinking. But in terms of solving mobility, in terms of solving, you know, complexity of movement, yeah, you can only do that a certain number of ways. So it's, it's a natural kind of combination. Mobility is one thing. So if we're in a water world, we'd have to learn to swim. Uh, and that imposes physical limitations. But... You know, if you look at it purely from a, a mechanical and adaptive point of view, evolution will move into the most efficient ways because it has all these possibilities. It's incredibly adaptable. I, I think that's very exciting. And if we look even at the microbial world, like I said, microbes take their energy from an electron and it doesn't matter where it comes from. And some can use it from uh, a positive redox and some from the opposite way of redox, right? It's just whether an electron's made available to capture and from sunlight. So once you become that refined, then your energy source is infinite, right? And so then the possibilities become infinite. And I think evolution shows us that because we've seen that in stages through Earth history. There was this whole radiation of the, uh, like the Burgess Shale fauna, so all kinds of body plans that were then, ne they were abandoned. They were never used again, but it was a whole experiment in one direction. And then because the conditions changed, they were abandoned, they went somewhere else and stuff. So with the time of geology, and the complexity of life systems, they evolve to maximize their potential within different niches. You've said the word complexity several times, yeah. and you seem, to be, you seem to subscribe to the idea that life is getting more complex. Is that right? Uh, I think to get life, you had to increase complexity enormously. Because even the simplest microbe is an incredibly complex machine. It has diffusion of only certain elements. It's got you know multiple layers in its membrane. It's got the mobility. And it's got compartmentalized organelles and all the rest of it. It's an unbelievably complicated piece of machinery. So you think um, the or emergence or the origin of life involves an increase in complexity of pre-existing autocatalytic cycles or something? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And since that time, I mean, it's reorganized in in, in infinity of ways. But I don't 
not really thought about it before. I don't know that life is getting more complex now. If you look at ecosystems through the geological past, they were completely filled in the Devonian in a different sort of set of ways uh, as they are now. So I'm not sure that life's getting more complex. Can you hold the stromatolite up to your face? <laughs> and we can say, now there's, there's you and there's the stromatolites. Now, now if we fossilize you and, and look at you three and a half billion years later, which of this, these two would be more complex? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a good analogy. And, and, and we are very complex systems because there are multiple um, communities that are actually living together, right? So we can't metabolize a lot of our food without the presence of microbes. And these guys didn't have to worry about that. So we're, we're certainly a much more complex system. Is it good um, to be complex? Uh, I can get you into trouble a lot of times. Yeah, it can be. If you, if you specialize too much, if you become too fitted into a narrow slot, that can be a danger because if that changes, then you've got nowhere to go. Like evolving to live on Earth, for example, a narrow, small little place for called example, Earth. For example, that's right. You could do much better and inhabit the entire solar system. <laughs> you get much galaxy. more complex. <laughs> you could have a lot more playgrounds. Um, but on the other hand, if you have the mechanisms for adaptability, and, and clearly humanity has shown that we have adaptability across, we live now across all the biozones, right? From the high Arctic to the hottest deserts, we can inhabit pretty much every environment because of our ability to make tools. If, uh, if we uh, could replay the tape of life and go back, let's say, be pre-Cambrian, and then say, okay, Earth, do what you're gonna do, how similar do you think is this an interesting question? How similar do you think that life would evolve? Would humans be here? Would vertebrates be here? Would, uh, you know, would there be a separation between animals and plants? Or, I mean, I guess that preceded the, the, the Cambrian explosion, but yeah. do you have a sense of how different Earth could have been? Well, I think this idea of convergent evolution is, is maybe a, a bit of a guide. It seems like, you know, in order to get through water, you've got to make a tail. You've got to, you know, find a way to have mobility. And you can do that in a number of different ways, but one way is always more efficient than another way. So if you look at sharks, for example, they're the ultimate streamlined organism for the water world. And there are many different types of fish and different species of sharks that have all, all evolved very similar sort of forms because it's the most efficient way to travel through that medium. And so I think there's an aspect to inevitability of evolution because it all has to fit within a world. And that world is either water or it's air or it's, you know, various trees or whatever. And so, you know, to get around trees, you need to be able to grab a branch and swing and move and climb up. So you have to have some feet to do that. And, and that's what evolution, you know, moves toward. Well, spirochetes move through water and they don't look very much like sharks. No, that's true. But they're at a much more uh, simplistic level. And, you know, these things build on each other. So once you get, and, and that's what's beautiful about the, but the Cambrian explosion is that we see predation for the first time. And so that once organisms are there and they develop more complexity, they start to, you know, eat on each other. And we know that, you know, in the example of insects and plants, there's a sort of arms race. So they get more complex because one develops a mechanism of defense. So the other one has to get more complicated to get a, you know, just builds up and gets more complex. So whether it would evolve into what it looks like now, um, I'd say that gets into the realm of speculation. I wouldn't be able to say. And you, see, you know, you can say, well, we're an incredibly sophisticated and evolved society, but then so was the whole dinosaur world, and that lasted for a lot longer, and that was one arrangement of occupying niche space with dinosaurs and relatively small amounts of mammals and birds, all very complex organisms, until there was sort of this, this step change that required. Well, let's suppose that you and I can get in a rocket ship and go to visit all these Earth-like planets that are billion. Let's go visit a billion of them. Yeah. Now... Can you make a guess about what the range of these other life forms will be like? Will they, for example, have animals, plants, and fungi? Will there be single cells, or will it be just or there be bacterial mats and no multicellularity? Or do we have enough evidence on Earth to think that multicellularity is a convergent feature of evolution? Will there be mobility with things with heads, for example? You know, these are type of more generic things that you could take a guess at. What are your guesses? Yeah. Well, I know from the Earth's Earth example, and that's all we have, that it took a very long time to develop complexity. It took billions of years to develop complexity in a system that stays relatively uniform because of that presence of liquid water without, you know, huge changes necessarily. And uh, that allows complexity to grow. When you and say complexity, what time. do you mean? 
Well, in terms of evolutionary development, into multicellularity and into animal life, so eukaryotic life, um, that third branch of the tree of life is separated from the bar bacteria and the archaea. Already quite early on, it appears, the oldest fossils that we have of definitive eukaryotes is only 1.6 billion years old. So the planet was already 3 billion years before eukaryotes appear definitively in the rock record. They may be a bit older, but um, it takes a while to develop that kind of complexity. Well, what's the difference? So I would, would say would in, in most places that we would go to explore, if you were lucky enough to find life, it would be single cell life. But you just talked about the complexity of eukaryotes compared to prokaryotes, as if the eukaryotes were more complex. Yeah. But if you have a bacterial community of all kinds of different bacteria doing all kinds of things here, and they're interacting with each other, and then I take a eukaryote and I internalize some of those components, yeah. essentially I've just miniaturized what was larger, put an ecosystem into what you now want to call one organism, and then say, oh, because this is an organism and it has an ecosystem in it, I'm going to call it complex, while the ecosystem before it unified and miniaturized, you're calling non-complex. Is that right? Well, yeah, because it has a very limited set of uh, ways of interacting in a uniform population. So. Um, a stromatolite, bacterial mat, has a limited form of interacting. Sets of ways of interactions, yeah. That's really? Right. I thought yeah. that you guys were finding all kinds of complexities in these stromatolites that you hadn't expected. Uh, not stromatolites, but... Uh, yeah, 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 and the yeah, forms of yeah, stromatolites, yeah. that's right, yeah. And um, we know now it looks like that, uh, you know, some of the different shapes actually relate to different metabolisms. So some use hydrogen, some use sulfur, some use iron. And those are the very basic elements that are around early on. But then with the eukaryote, I think the challenge is, is it's almost like, a, um, I don't know, a meeting of, uh, of a group of academics in a room. You've got to get them all to work together in some kind of way. So once you internalize, you know, prokaryote within, you know, this developing more complex animal, it's got to actually serve a function that then provides nutrients for it. So it's, it's a built up set of reactions. And that provides opportunity because that increases complexity. But and that's the, hard to develop. I this dramatic. Could you hold it up again, please? Now, yeah. how many species of bacteria do you think went into that? We just have no idea, and I, Two, I won't be thousand? able to. I, I won't be able to speculate. We only know from modern examples from Shark Bay, and we used to think that they were very simple and that you could explain the change of shape of modern stromatolites by species. We used to call them species. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But now, you know, people have gone in and separated the DNA and done the analysis, and there are like 10,000 organisms making up a Shark Bay stromatolite. Unbelievable complexity. That sounds more complex than the eukaryotes that you just described well, as being more complex than they are. Yeah, so probably the communities also develop complexity through time, and that's one of the things we're studying at the rise of atmosphere oxygen about halfway through Earth history, we see a total change and an increase in complexity in the way that stromatolites grew. They suddenly start to form these very complex branching structures. And we don't see that in these very old ones, but they have very complex branching structures. There are different types of microbialites, some only with clots. So I get the feeling that microbial communities also become more complex through time, leading eventually to eukaryotes and the different ways of interacting. So I think it is about complexity complexity of interactions between single um, single cells or prokaryotes, but different types of prokaryotes, and then leading to more complexity. Yeah, I, I think it's all about getting more complex. And, and it's really so, just so, the second law of thermodynamics, isn't it? It's just about complexity and energy distribution. Well, <laughs> we're scientists, and so when we use a word, we should have an idea of what it means. How do you measure complexity? Um, well, if we just take uh, look like organic geochemistry, complexity is based on the number of bonds between carbon chains and oxygen and, and the, you know, the little things that hang so that's off that's how the complex end of it. a molecule is. Yeah, that's how complex a molecule is. And, and, you know, biology is a bunch of molecules. DNA is a molecule. And that's an incredibly complex, doubly twisting helix of very long chain of, of, uh, of elements making, you know, one entity. That so all life has DNA. So yeah. all life has DNA, so therefore it's all equally complex. Uh, if you want to put it down to that level, yeah. Or that, well, if you want to do follow that train of reasoning, say, oh, the things with the most com most DNA are more complicated, more complex. But we, but that was this origin of the C problem. We used to think that 
oh, we're complicated, so we're the most complex, we should have the most DNA, and then we were so disappointed when we <laughs> see, oh, only 22,000 genes, look at that one over there that's got 50,000, and that's just yeah. a turtle or something. Oh, look at that lizard over there, that's got more genes, it's more complex. And they said, oh, let's right. throw out that definition of complexity because we want one that'll make us the most complex. That yeah. seems like a self-serving thing that's not really, I wouldn't call that science, I'd call that vanity. That, that probably is a little bit of vanity involved. I guess one of the advances that uh, the community has made over over recent years is, is realizing that within DNA there's a lot of junk DNA, DNA that's inherited and not actually used for anything. And so maybe the, the measurement of the length of gene sequences in DNA is not actually a realistic uh, way of recording complexity in terms of utilization. Um, certainly we know that for the most primitive microbes with archaea their DNA chains are shorter. Um, so there may be some relevance in that, but I, I'd say it's the way that you interact with, with the world and the way that uh, the metabolism gains. So I mean, one of the big things in complexity is this development of the ATP uh, process, right? And um, sorry, not ATP, but the photosynthetic pathways. And that's an, a remarkable set of uh, reactions that require you to use energy to develop a gradient, it's like pushing a big steel ball uphill. You've got to expend energy to get the potential energy that, that's then used in photosynthesis. And that's almost counterintuitive because it's actually going against the way that natural systems work, which is to break things down into simpler processes. This is making a more complex process in a bunch of stages without knowing the end product is going to give you a higher amount of potential energy, which is where oxygen comes in. And I, I think that's an extraordinary thing, and that is absolutely a measure of complexity. Well, to but, but that reactions. was developed in bacteria, and you've been arguing that bacteria yeah. is simpler than eukaryotes. So you're, you're saying something that the bacteria did is really, really, really complex, and then essentially eukaryotes are just, hey, put two, two bacteria together and call it a eukaryote, and then say yeah. it's more complex. Yeah. That sounds like, <laughs> that sounds like <laughs> cheating to me. <laughs> well, maybe it is cheating. I, I have to admit, I'm a big admirer of microbes. Um, but I don't know the whole systematics well enough to be able to argue that. But I know that all, clearly the eukaryotes are a very complex way of, of, uh, of undertaking life. Now you want to show us some uh, other things here? Yeah, so I've got a couple of other friends along. We've talked about, um, we've talked about hot springs and so I recently went to New Zealand um, to Rotorua and the area to look at um, you know, the signs of life around these hot springs. And this is a sample that was growing just a few months ago on the lip of a hot spring there and is made up of beautifully complex branching small stromatolites. Um, but this is just a, a beautiful sample. This is very fine, silicious mud that they're growing in. But I like this one because it shows the complexity of still re relatively simple microbes making these complex branching structures that you know look like a coral reef or a branching tree it or something. It does look like a coral. How long ago was that alive? Well, just literally uh, a couple of months ago. So that was a lot. You, you picked it when it was alive. Yeah, yeah, in February. You yeah, killed yeah. it. You no, murdered. It was on the edge. It was an exposed <laughs> on the edge of a pool. <laughs> the stuff was already uh, anyway, there desiccated, are... <laughs> but it's only just, it's just very recent. Yeah. Does it stink when it rots? I mean, uh, when you first get it out of the water, the, and, and because the water is, is sulfurous, you I mean, can smell it. the sulfur in it. No, but I mean, stuff, so. the, there are organisms there that had to die, Yeah. right? So did you wash it with alcohol or something to get it like that? or? Uh, like I said, this had been actually exposed on oh, the rim of a so pool. So it was it, already uh, pretty dead. It was already pretty dead, yeah. So, okay, you yeah. want to show us something else? Yeah, so I've got some other things here. This is, um, so one of, the, one of the transitions of life, so we talked about sort of life originating in hot springs, and then it must have adapted to the oceans. And in fact, it looks like it adapted to the oceans pretty early. And, and that was one thing I was going to mention, is that one of, the other, one of the other factors that goes against an origin of life in the oceans is that the potassium to sodium ratio, which cells have inside their membrane, is similar to freshwater, but very different from seawater. And in fact, the ions in seawater, these high potassium ratios and stuff like that, they're too hard for life to get going. They break these molecules down as well. So that's another really big feature that life may have started on land. And it developed these membranes to protect the living material inside, 
And once those membranes were developed, then it could migrate into the oceans and stuff. And this is, this is completely opposite to what, you know, the, the classic uh, evolutionary model of, you know, the fish, you know, the, the early animals coming out of the ocean from fish mm -hmm. and then onto land and stuff like that. Actually, it turns out that life probably started on land, went into the oceans, and then came back up on land. So, so can you summarize that argument again? What is the strongest evidence for that reversal? So there's, uh, there's two really strong arguments. Um, I think one is this water problem for prebiotic chemistry that to make complex organic molecules it must have had this wetting dry dehydrate, okay. de de dehydration dehydration thing. cycles and can't that's that easier on fresh water no, you can't do it in the oceans there's okay. water everywhere right so but, and the but other we've known about that for a long time so the the hydrothermal vent people must have uh, I've talked to them occasionally yeah. and they say oh we can do dehydration reactions. On well, they the, think they can do, but they've actually never shown that they can do it in okay, water okay. and stuff. So All right. they talk about membranes and adhesion, and it gets incredibly complicated, um, whereas, in fact, it seems, seems much easier mm -hmm. to be able to do it on land surfaces and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And then in, in all uh, microorganisms, they have this internal uh, fluid that has this Potassium to sodium ratio, that's very common. It's in fact common through all the different branches of life. And that's at a certain level. And that's similar to what you find in fresh water, but not in salty water. So there's a question then of if you were in seawater, and we don't know the composition of very early oceans, but um, it looks like it probably would have been more salty rather than less salty. So getting the potassium sodium ratios is more difficult. Um, but that's another feature. And then there are these other aspects about um, how to concentrate some of these other elements that you need for catalysis, boron. like boron. Zinc is another big one. And um, uh, we know that in hydrothermal environments, you can concentrate some elements, but making them in a, in a way that's available over long periods is just very difficult. And now we're looking at hot springs that appears that you can do that. In ways. So I think I think that's very exciting. And then exciting. there's the concentration of microenvironments that are very different from each other. Yeah, that's Makes right. Sense. And there's the potential for you know really having very different environments that then mix and match. And I find that very exciting. So, okay. So, so then the question is, when did life reemerge back onto land, or did it ever did it ever leave land? And you know the the earliest evidence used to be not very long ago was evidence for fungi on land about 800 million years ago. But now we've, you know, there are a few studies, and, and this is uh, one example that we found from South Africa recently, that this is just a sandstone, but can you see these sort of wrinkly dark layers uh, that are through the sandstone? Well, it turns out that these are microbial mats, and these sandstones are on land. They're wind-blown sand dunes, and during little intervals where there was a little bit of moisture around, these microbial mats were able to grow on these migrating sand dunes and the troughs of these migrating sand dunes. And we can tell that this was windblown sand because the, that when you take a thin slice of the rock and you look in detail at that, the sand grains are incredibly perfectly rounded, but they have these radial cracks that go from the outside of the grain to the inside of the grain. And that's when the grains actually impact each other. They crack. And that only happens when there's wind. If there's water around, there's always a fluid medium and they just slip past each other, uh -huh. right? And so these wind-blown sand grains are very distinctive. It's well known from studies of modern sand grains and that's what we find in these three billion year old rocks. So we've got evidence here and in another place in South Africa from 3.2 billion years that there were already microbial mats on land. And now with the dresser stuff, finding these evidence for hot springs and the 3.5 stuff, that's also on a terrestrial land surface. So actually, land was inhabited by microbial communities as far back as we have geological records. Well, let's say that stromatolites, they're all marine, aren't they? Well, stromatolites is actually a, a, a structure made in rock. Right. They're most common in marine environments, but they also are formed in caves and lakes in the modern day. So they don't have to be. Well, the one you just showed us, for example, from Rotorua, isn't that freshwater? This is freshwater, yeah, freshwater. exactly, yeah. So they, they can grow in freshwater, they can grow in caves. Stromatolites are just a community of microbes that change their microenvironment to precipitate ions that are dissolved in the rock by concentration gradients, or they trap and bind material and build up layers through time. That's how they make their, their now, structures. Now, we've been talking about science that has to do with the big picture and the origin of life on Earth and what it can tell us about the origin of life elsewhere.
Now, you teach students this. What are some of the biggest misconceptions that you've run across in your student population when you try to tell them some of these this scientific story of Genesis? <laughs> I'd, say that, I'd say the biggest misconception is that there's consensus on any issue in science <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, think, I think Newton got a couple of laws pretty right, but in, in geology and in uh, geobiology, because we're dealing with very old rocks and we don't see the things squiggling and wriggling still, it's all got a layer of interpretation. And even with things as you know hardcore as a fractionated isotope of carbon and stuff, well, it turns out you can do that in two ways. And so you've just got to investigate more and more deeply. So I get comments from students that say, oh, I'm not interested in going to science because it's all been done. And so, mm -hmm. <laughs> you've got no idea. And as new technologies develop, we always find more questions to answer and you, get, you, know, you just get down into more and more levels of, of detail. So I think one of the really, I think we live in an unbelievably exciting times. We are discovering brand new things every day across the scientific community. And it really, it saddens me that the general public is not actually rejoicing in these discoveries every day. It's unbelievable, even just within this school. And it would be no different at ANU or any other university. There are fundamental discoveries that are enriching our knowledge of the natural world every day. And I think it's just extraordinary. And the student misconception is that science is already done and it's about certainty. And it's about certainty. And so one thing we try and expose them to is different points of view. We have discussions and we have debates and that happens on field trips, you know. Say, oh, that's not what it is, it's this. And, and what those discussions do is it makes you refine your observational data, go and investigate it more thoroughly and remove the possibilities for disagreement by narrowing in on what you really can document and understand. So, and, and that is a process that takes time. You don't have an instantaneous view. Many people do form a view very quickly, but as scientists, we need to back it up with fact. I mean, that's, that's at a very general level. In terms of uh, evolution of life and origin of life, you know, we're, we're, we're left with things like these wrinkly old rusty rocks, and we don't know what the metabolisms are that make it. So we infer, we know that this was made by living communities, and maybe that's something we can recognize if we go to another planet. We're looking at ways of really testing that. But in terms of getting down to the details, as you go back in time, it gets more and more complex and harder and harder. So there's still big open areas where we cannot constrain the data to really knowledgeable facts. And um, we're trying to fill those in, and new discoveries help fill that in, you know. Now life is not at 3.5, it's at 3.7. Well, that narrows the window. That tells us something about rates, and it, it's just adding constraints. I'm a student just about to start my university education, and I'm interested in this question, are we alone? And I've heard about astrobiology. It sounds kind of cool and interesting. Uh, do you have any advice for me? Absolutely. Go into it. Full, <laughs> full bore. Learn as much as you can. Read about everything. I think the reason I got excited about astrobiology is because I think actually it's, it's a very challenging discipline because I've got to be able to speak to people like Charlie Lineweaver or astrophysicists who do things that I have no conception of, but we've got to find a way of merging all these things together to get a better understanding. And I, I think we're at the edge of a really challenging era where we're combining what used to be silos into this much larger discipline, and it's really a whole natural systems kind of investigation to understand how planets work, how you know gravitational waves ex affect this, how biology affects chemistry, and all those things are now being integrated. And that's fantastic. That was never done even 20 years ago. Right? But that so, kind of goes against the grain of what science is supposed to be, and that is become ever more differentiated, ever more siloed. And astrobiology has been right. critics, criticized because, oh, they're just a bunch of people who are, can't, can't talk to each other. Because, well, actually, they're not well educated in any particular field, and they're just generalists, and therefore it's kind of like what scientists were 200 years ago. But that's not true. I'm, I'm a geologist. I'm also an astrobiologist. You're an astrophysicist and you're also an astrobiologist. I think what we do as astrobiologists is we try and expand our specialities. And we have to find people that we can work with, that we can trust, that we respect, who know their fields, and then find ways of combining our knowledge. It's almost like, you know, trying to take two internets and make a super internet. And, you know, you're just trying to increase the knowledge base. And it's a challenge for us because we need to have enough wherewithal to be able to bridge across those discipline divides. And that's by experience, that's by dialogue, that's by discussion, that's by having a common goal of understanding that brings these things together. So typically the people who criticize astrobiologists for being you know, non-scientific are people outside the field. They think, and 
you know, we've got people here at the university who have said, oh, you're just looking for a little green man on Mars and stuff, ha, 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 ha. But they don't realize that it's underpinned by fundamental science. And that's a astrobiology to me is bringing these things together to make the next great leap forward. We have a, as astrobiologists, we have a question. One question we want answered is, are we alone? What are the, what's the best scientific way to address this question, to try to answer that question? Well, and so people are doing that in a number of different ways. So there are the, uh, the exoplanet group that is looking at the composition of atmospheres, or you know, they're looking for planets for a start that are in the right size, habitability zone, age, all that sort of thing. They're finding more and more that looks better and better. Now people are starting to think about looking at the atmospheres of those plasmas. Is there oxygen, which is the biosignature, and all those things? And then, of course, there's the, the big science um, experiments of sending rovers to Mars and to other planets within our, or planetary bodies within our solar system, and actually looking for physical evidence of Mars. And one of the great big challenges, and, and I'm part of this, is that, you know, if you've got a whole planet to go to, where would you go and look for life? If you've got one place that you can drop a rover with a 10-kilometer radius of investigation, where would you go? What rock types would you look for? And because of our recent discoveries in the, in the Pilbara, finding that some of the oldest evidence of life is around hot springs, and knowing that hot springs through the geological record all have biosignatures right back to three and a half billion years ago, the age of crust on Mars has biosignatures, I'd go and look for hot spring deposits. Was well, the m water on Mars, was it fresh water? Or was it salt water? Uh, currently, the, these recurring slope lineae, they know the compositions. It's unbelievably briny water. <laughs> There's probably nothing right, that could that, live in them But now. I wasn't asking about the water no, no, now. But, uh, yeah. but three and a half billion years ago when there was lots of water, what do yeah. you think of that water? It looks like it was probably, we don't know, but there are, there are beds of sulfates, which are very similar to what we get you know, on the edges of modern oceans. So it was salty water, but the volume suggests that it was, you know, probably quite reasonable water that could have supported life. But not if life only forms in freshwater environments. But we know that Mars has hot spring deposits on the edges of volcanoes. And when you say hot springs, you mean freshwater hot springs. That's yeah, what yeah, freshwater hot springs. And so, you know, and one of the really exciting prospects is, a, is an area that they've already been to with a spirit rover to a place called Columbia Hills where they found these deposits of opaline silica and opaline silica is incredibly fragile, right? It, it, it recrystallizes and breaks down to quartz and other silica minerals with any kind of heat or disturbance. But this is still opaline silica that's three and a half billion years old. And what that, does that mean? comes from a hot spring. That's the most likely origin for these deposits. And they have textures in those Martian opaline silica deposits that now a group from Arizona State University have found in modern hot springs on Earth in extremely dry environments of the uh, Atacama Desert in Chile. Mm -hmm. From this place called El Tadio, they have these beautiful nodules with kind of digitate protrusions that they find, these sort of little fingers, and they're all microstomatolites. And they find exactly the same shapes in these deposits on Mars. I would, yeah, in a heartbeat, I'd go there. So do you think there, <laughs> there used to be stromatolites on Mars? These digitate structures of opaline silica are very interesting. And um, we're also looking at another way of, of uh, because one thing is to have life and another thing is to preserve it so that you can see it when you go back, you know, and do experiments and stuff like that. So silica is really important as a, as a preserving mechanism for life because it's so inert and it just, like it mummifies things perfectly and stuff. So we do get microfossils in chert and in silica and stuff like that, great. The other thing that, uh, the other way that you preserve uh, traces of life is when you have a volcanic eruption. So there's a great example from human history called Pompeii, where there was a living community and boom, you know, a big explosion came and it just buried everything in life form, right? So you get these casts of people in the wall, everything's perfectly preserved. But it turns out in the geological record, the same thing has happened back billions of years. That if you think of sort of moving sediment around on the sea floor, right? If there are periods where it's quiet, the microbial community can grow and thrive and make a covering of that sediment, but then the next higher energy will come and just wash it all away, right? So you don't get anything preserved. But if that microbial community was there and an ash deposit fell on it, it's perfectly preserved. So some of the oldest 
evidence for complex life on Earth is from the Ediacaran fauna, which is about 600 million years ago. And the best preserved record of that with living array of life forms that they can measure the density and distribution of these different types of organisms is under an ash bed. And the exciting thing again about on Mars at Columbia Hills is they have these opaline silica deposits and right beside it is about that thick of felsic ash that fell on top of it. And so if I was organized, if I was driving, I would drill through that felsic layer and find the microbial community that was living under that eruptive event. That would be my go-to place. <laughs> okay. All right. And we're going, in February, we go to the next landing site workshop for uh -huh. Mars 2020. Uh -huh. And you're going to tell making, them that. <laughs> absolutely. I've got a presentation slot. I'm going to tell them that. Absolutely. I said, go there. <laughs> okay. And last question. Are we alone? Maybe. And why do you say that? Because we don't have the data to back it up. And as a scientist, I, I would love to pursue my belief and my, my, uh, my numbers game, but it's guesswork. And as a scientist, I cannot give you a definitive answer because that's not constrained. So this is a beautiful little oval structure here, and then you get these little irregular bumps, and you can see this really irregular kind of texture. So this is the, well, it was the oldest evidence of life up until August when we had that publication in Nature. Mm -hmm. um, but these are stromatolites, and the beautiful thing is that on the underside, you get these wonderfully preserved ripples. These are the, oh. the cause of water flowing over very shallow water environment. And you can see the structure here is very linear, which is what we know from uniformitarian geology. It's just moving its physics. It's just water moving particles mm -hmm. around. Okay. And then the converse is this very irregular structure, and that's biology. Okay. And so those are the two sides of the one coin. All right, and next. Well, this one is this... Um, let me get real close. A little crust here. Wait, wait, let me get focused. Yeah. Okay. So this is this little crust unit that we have that contains sure. boron. That's rich in boron. And um, it's this little unit through here. And this is one of the few areas in the world that we know we get concentrations of boron, which is this prebiotic. What does it look like? So I mean, what does They're it tiny look? little crystals that are in these crusts. They're, t they're too small to see. They're less than mm -hmm. a millimeter. Mm -hmm. But they just sit in this little brown unit through here. How did you know they were there? I didn't. I just took it. I, I was interested in this because I thought it was a stromatolite. Mm. And took a sample and cut it in half. And then it's a very different kind of unit altogether. And it's just packed with little terminal Show me crystals. the other one, the other side that we're, you're interested in. Yeah. So this is the, the these fine layers here okay. are what we're interested in. Do that again with your finger. There's these fine layers that wrap around this sort of pebbly unit underneath. This is the, the unit of interest that we collected. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this has really brought us into the origin of life field, which we hadn't had even last time when I, I talked to you. Really. Okay, next. Well, this one is, uh, is a beauty. This is from um, a hot spring in New Zealand. A recent one, I guess. Yeah, this, is, uh, this was plucked off the edge of a uh, hot spring just a couple of months ago, and it's got these beautiful columnar structures, and it shows the complexity of life, forming all these branches and very irregular kind of structures and living in a medium that was being flushed by quite hot water. So this is fine silicious mud from the hot spring itself. Fine silicious mud. Yep. And they were able to grow and make these beautiful structures. What are they, corals or what are they? Here. No, these are stromatolites. Those are stromatolites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't see any stroma. Well, you have to look finely, but there are stroma. Uh, because the mud's so fine, you can just see some, some very fine layers in through here. Mm -hmm. And on the very edge here of this one as well. Okay. But beautiful, irregular sort of branches. And so this is something we think is, uh, is actually a very good analog for, for these older structures, at least for the environment. But it shows uh, much more beautiful complexity. Okay, next. Uh, this one is another, this one doesn't look so exciting, but... Um, these are, are very fine layers preserved here, less than a millimeter thick, and they are bent. And in fact, these form panels that are up to 40 centimeters long and stacked up on edge, like, like this, in almost these sort of fanning rosettes. It's a big conglomerate. And it turns out that um, these are microbial mats. These are all very fine microbial mats. Come a little bit closer. Yeah, very fine microbial mats. Do that again with your finger? Just across here, this very, very fine layering. And these were solidified by the hot spring fluids 
as they were growing, and then there was a storm event or a flood event, and it ripped them up and piled them up like a, a train wreck. And uh, we've got the preserved okay. remnants of this material here. You can see that they sort of bend and wobble a bit. Mm -hmm. So when they got ripped up, they weren't solid rock yet, and there was still sort of this living plastic material. Mm. Mr. Madeleine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, more microbial life. Yeah. Okay. And then, <coughs> about three billion years, life was already living on land. These three are, billion years on land. Yep, yeah, this is microbial mats again in a sandstone. Let me get this, hold it still. Yep. Yeah. Move your finger back and forth. Yeah, so these are the microbial mats in sandstone that we know were um, aeolian. They were these blown sand dunes. And then during periods where the sand sort of slowed down, there was a little bit of moisture accumulated. You get these wrinkly microbialite mats. These are made of kerogen. And this is from South Africa. This is from the Pongola supergroup. But these are definitely communities that inhabited terrestrial environments already by three billion years ago. And you can see the individual sand grains. See these sort of little dark specks? Those are the individual sand grains. And they're incredibly in thin section. They're beautifully rounded. And they actually have fractures from the outside of the grain to the inside that show that they impacted each other. And that's the hallmark of windblown sand. Because if there's a fluid medium, they're rounded, but they never impact each other. They always just, you know, roll around and past each other. Mm. But these ones all have these uh, impact little fractures. So this is definitely an Aeolian sandstone with these beautifully irregular microbial mats on it. Really okay. amazing.